anyone who would ever use the phrase, it's just pizza, they're beyond hope. And, and you, you can only hope that at some point in their life they're, they're willing to, to try it. And, and then, then no words are necessary. All they have to do is try it. You know, my, I would just silently say to myself, it's your loss. It's your loss. Just get away from it. I haven't been to New Haven and had Pepe's, Sally's, and Modern. You really can't talk about pizza with any authority, I don't think. Sally's. Modern. Pepe's. Sally's. Pepe's first. Modern. There's great things about each of them, and I, uh, I don't like to take sides in the, in the pizza war. You have to go with Sally's. So is Sally's. Oh, Sally's. Sally's. I was raised on Sally's. By far Sally's. I like Sally's. Sally's, basically. And if I had to choose between the three, I would choose modern. 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 Modern hot beats. Right here, Frank Pepe's. Best pizza in the world. Pepe's. Pepe's pizza. I'm a Pepe guy. Pepe's. 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 I love Pepe's. Yay! Pepe's. Sally's Pepe's are modern. Yes. <laughs> Do you think there's a huge learning curve when you're sitting down for that first pie? There is a learning curve. Because people will, oh, why is it cut like this? Why is it shaped like this? Why is it burnt? And yeah, I bet when they say, why is it burnt? A little part of you, your heart stops. And you say, oh, we need to educate these people right now that this is not burnt, this is char, this is the beauty, this is what this pizza is all about. Pepe's was my first experience. And I remember being blown away by the char of the pie and thinking, they do this, they can do this, and this is pizza. It was a different kind of experience, a different kind of pizza. It was dirtier, it was grittier, um, it was more flavorful. It just had a lot more personality than New York style pizza or Neapolitan pizza or, you know, those deeper dish pies that I was used to as a, as a kid. People get scared just by looking at it with never tasting it. And then once they taste it, they get it. And then it's like, oh, okay. I'll tell you 99% of the time, when they want to send it back, and I can convince them to take a bite of it first, they keep it. At Modern, especially, we use open flame brick ovens. So there's an open flame, it's like cooking in your fireplace. So you're gonna get a little bit of char on the outside. It's like barbecue. I always bring people to Pepe's or Sally's or Modern, and the first thing is they, they don't, they can't believe that it's so, it's so charred, so, well, burnt, they think. But I think as soon as they, they eat it, they realize, oh, that's not really burnt. It's a, a little bit of smoke, but it's not burnt. If you say the pizza's burned, I, I just say they cook it well done. They cook it the right way, basically. It doesn't taste burned to me when I eat it. I don't know any other place or any other kind of pizza that when you leave, you have dirty fingernails. You need to actually, like, thoroughly wash your hands after eating a New Haven pizza, because uh, it looks like, I don't know, you've been gardening. Don't let anybody tell you that there was pizza before 1565 in Italy because Italy didn't have tomatoes until, until the 1600s. It's interesting because everyone has this image of Italians eating sauce and having pizza well before that time. Actually, it was brought to the king of Naples in, in 1565 by the king of Peru as a gift. What they did was they planted these seeds at the base of Vesuvius in this very you know, fertile, rich, lava-coated land that grew these what they call San Marzano tomatoes, which is known the world over for Neapolitan sauce. You know, when you're up in the fields tending the sheep or you're plowing the land, so you, you brought up some bread and you had some, some dried tomatoes and you just slathered on bread, and that was your lunch. And that was the origins of pizza. Once you pull back the layers and start understanding where pizza comes from, you realize that it was brought over mostly by the women who, in southern Italy, made do with very, very few resources. 
They were very ingenious in what they cooked. When you think about immigration and how it dovetails in with pizza, that was the food of choice amongst many, many immigrants because that's all they could afford. You have to remember the role of the women in all this is that they were the difference between starvation and survival. La cogina de la povera gente, it was the, the, the language, you know, the, the food of the poor, which now becomes number one on the American food list. Everyone craves it. People come from all over the place to eat it. Why? Well, it evolved over centuries and centuries of, of women, caring women, nurturing women who, who cooked with, with scarce resources and came up with this phenomenal cuisine called Campania and Cuisine, which is part of it is, is pizza. Italian immigration to New Haven uh, really started um, with the sort of need for workers. Sergeant Locke, and this, this is no pun, was a magnet for especially people from the Amalfi Coast. Sergeant Hardware, in the two decades before World War I, was among the great hardware manufacturers in the world. They were pioneers of mass customization. They were 10 to 12,000 full-time employees. It was a very high quality manufacturing firm and it ran out of Yankees early. Sartan's wife had Italian roots and she actually was instrumental in convincing her husband to send agents throughout the Campania. They combed uh, the poorer towns of, of the South and offered uh, young men who were mostly unskilled uh, opportunities to come here and find immediate work. They would get off the boat literally in New York and take the Richard Peck which was a small uh, boat that took people right to the harbor of New Haven. And they pulled right up to the dock and they had a, a saying uh, that amongst the immigrants, they say, U boat si ferma a sergeants. The boat stops at sergeants. In other words, as soon as you got to New Haven, your first stop was at the employment agency. You checked in at sergeants, you got your job. And that's why there were so many Italians that were on Worcester Street, the Worcester Square neighborhood, it's because they found them housing for them too. So they literally were paid for, they were sponsored for, by, by Sargent, who, who took this whole strata of poor people, basically unskilled young men, and gave them work on their production lines, you know, at the factories making locks and coffins and crucifixes, and they were the forerunners of sort of uh, the Home Depot of today. They exported their goods all over the world, even in the 10s and the 20s. New Haven was going through a, uh, an economic boom. There were burgeoning factories all over the city that were looking for uh, unskilled labor, and they found it in, in many of it, in, in you know, Italian immigrants. Sargent's was a, was a colossal building. It just took up city blocks. It was huge. I traced out the home addresses of people hired in the first six months of 1910. And sure enough, they are tightly bunched in what we now think of as Worcester Square. At one time, you could just walk down from any part of Worcester Square neighborhood and just walk down to Sargent's and, and, and go to work. And so that's, that's what they did. So New Haven accumulated, largely through their efforts, an unusually large and unusually geographically focused immigrant population of Italians. It was hoped for things like steady work, unheard of for most farming people in, in Southern Italy, an apartment of your own that you could eventually own, the American dream. But ever so quickly, they realized that they were without their staple foods. And we find that bakeries, Italian bakeries, were first listed as early as 1890 in city directories. And it's from those bakeries that the original pizzerias evolved. I don't like to hear the word pizza. I grew up in a generation of loyal New Haven not just Italian Americans, Irish Americans, Polish Americans, whatever you were, you always referred to that fine Italian crust as our beets. There is an image, a great image of another historic pizzeria that um, was the, a different family. This was the, the Majorino family. They had a place called Majorino's Restaurant and they had an awesome image of the three brothers behind the bar with a sign behind them that says, a apostrophe pizza but it's, as we pronounce it, Abitz. And it's the only evidence we've ever found of the word Abitz having an apostrophe, which takes us back to how Abitz got started. The article before a, a word would be, you know, in Italian would be La Pizza, which is proper Italian. But in, a, in, in Neapolitan dialect, you didn't say La, it was A or O. So it was 
A beats. 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 New Haven A beats. 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 Minga. I think that's how you pronounce it. I used to call it a beach because that's what my father used to call it. I think as time went on and as I got older, it began to change with me. You know, I started saying a pizza. You know, I, not unless there was a couple coming from Italy, true Italians, and they'd said our beats. Then I would say our beats because we could relate. It was never called pizza. Where are you gonna have, we're going for our beats. You're going for our beats. Here we are Polish people. We're going for our beats. It's always good to have a title that no one understands. You better say it right. The first record of a pizzeria comes from a gentleman named Francesco Scelzo. And he had a pizzeria on Hamilton Street. It was a bakery in the back with a big coal-fired oven. You had to go down an alley, past the tenement to get to it. And there was a tenement in the back, once noted as the Beehive, because it had 18 rooms in it that were rented out to immigrants. This site was the first known pizzeria, and there's a whole family history about how the sign was spelled wrong. Instead of Pizzeria Napolitana, it was spelled Pazzaria Napolitana, meaning crazy house. So after this kind of evolution of these early bakeries into pizzerias, we do get some verification of early pizza makers. Scalzo being one, another being Ignacio Campasano. We have records of his family actually opening up a bakery in 1917. It was sort of a behind the house bakery and he would deliver bread, but he would also uh, cart around pizza on his, uh, on his cart. Campasano eventually uh, opened up a storefront bakery right on Hill Street, um, which was basically called uh, Pizzeria Napolitana or Camposano Zabitz. His bakery definitely served um, pizza and bread. It was, it was hand in hand. Pepe's pizza is, you know, different and, and special. You feel as though it's not it's not a, so, as much of a business that's, that's invested in this pizza. It's, you, feel, you feel that it's someone's life. You, that it, when, you, when you see a Pepe's pizza, it's the product of someone's life, their life's work. Total commitment to this pizza. That's the way it struck me. And the top pizza in America goes to Pepe's in New Haven, a 90-year-old institution which has won the Daily Meal Contest three years in a row. Honestly, over the years, I think it's six or seven years that we've been doing this list, there's only one year that Pepe has not been number one on that list. And it was knocked off by Defara and then went right back to number one. You can't talk about pizza in this country unless you talk about Pepe's. In the grand scheme of all things pizza, Frank Pepe is number one to five. He came back from World War I. He was here in 1907. However, he returned to, to the war to, to fight for Italy in World War I. And he returned married in, in January of 1919. He worked at Sargent's. He didn't like it. He gravitated to learning how to bake bread here. And he joined up with a larger bakery, Generoso Muro, where other bakers were working, such as his brother, Peter. He founded Frank Pepe Pizzeria in 1925, rented uh, a location which is now part of our, our annex, which is called The Spot. Well, he was working out of there, and he was you know, selling his pizzas you know, with his headdress and the cart. Literally selling it for five cents a pizza and he went to factories, he went to the produce market, and he got well known for that. He couldn't keep track of who owed him money. He couldn't document where he brought the breads to. He couldn't read or write. So that's when his wife, my grandmother said, well, let's have him come to us. The spot is the original location and the original oven. He was there from 1925 to about 38.
When the repeal of prohibition happened in 1933, Connecticut state law allowed restaurants to have a tavern license and you could sell beer and stay open until 3 a.m. in the morning. And Pepe followed suit. He had enough money saved up, he had a growing family, he lived upstairs from a meat market and a grocery store, and he got money together and bought the buildings. And he converted those two stores into what was then considered the largest pizzeria in the country. And that's phenomenal, considering that New York City, Boston, and other cities in the 30s had some sizable pizza restaurants. Nobody had 136 seats in two rooms. Pepe opened the doors to uh, other than just Italians coming into a pizzeria. So that's 1935, he bought the building. 1936, he expanded, he built a giant 14-foot brick oven made by Middleby in Boston, had a local mason put it together and just started chugging out pizzas. My grandfather, he was a charming fellow. He was actually very self-effacing it oftentimes, as I remember him. Uh, he, he died when I was 18 years old. But I think he had a great entrepreneurial spirit, and I think he was very charming, and I think he really drew people in. He also had a sense of self-promotion. Even though he was, like I said, he was very self-effacing, you would never know it, but what I'm seeing now as I archive the imagery of, of the past, you know, there's so many of him with, in, his, in his garb, if you will, and his, you know, his hat and, and bow tie, and uh, he took the time, and he must have had the wherewithal to know that this, well, this was significant. It has nothing to do with the pizza itself, but it also has to do with, I think, bringing people in. I think the popularity was based a lot on that as well. Another phenomenal thing that Frank Pepe did was he had the first ever pizza box, at least the first record of a pizza box in the world made for him. We're talking about 1936. The story goes is that a customer worked at the National Folding Box Company, and he offered Pepe to make his own boxes. This historic box was found in the attic of Pepe's by one of the family members. It's the oldest record of a pizza box in the world. Frank Pepe helped Americanize pizza. Frank Pepe also helped bring his version, his family's version of pizza to America. And it's what we know as American style pizza. I like the red pie uh, with bacon. Uh, I like the white clam with bacon, and I like the white pie with fresh tomatoes. I don't know. That, oh, my dogs are playing. Uh, the cheese pizza, the, uh, the margarita, and the clam pizza, amazing. That's Sally's favorite pie, love the plain pie. Sausage and mushroom. Sausage and mozzarella. Sliced tomato. If I'm feeling crazy, sausage. Margarita or clam. All of them. Depends on the day. And my husband, husband's favorite pizza. Honey, what's your favorite pizza? Anchovies. Pepperoni. The Italian bomb. Plain tomato. The tomato pie at Sally's. A plain pie. Plain tomato with grated cheese. Plain pie. Plain with garlic. Plain with garlic. Plain, plain cheese pizza. pizza. The cheese pizza. The moots. The white clam at Pepe's. Clam and garlic. Clam. Clam. The white 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 clam, the white clam pizza. The white clam. The white clam. The clam and with bacon at Peppies. Bacon and onion. Yeah. Bacon and sausage. Yeah. Sausage bacon. Bacon. Bacon and mozzarella. <laughs> bacon with the mozzarella and marinara. Bacon. 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 The double bacon, well done. The anchovies. Fresh tomato, the local fresh tomato, with mozzarella and bacon. It's just like you're having a toasted cheese sandwich, no. believe me. And then they would have broccoli robin season at Sally's. Um, and I could go on and on. Bomb. My husband prefers the 23-inch Italian bomb. The greatest experience I had at Pepe's was having their pizza. If I have to pass away in this world, Sally would be the last bite I would want to have. A 
real sign of accomplishment in New Haven is the secret number at Sally's. Now, I had the secret number before I became mayor. Uh, I was given the secret number. Um, of course, if you told anyone the secret number, you were in danger of not being able to use the secret number. The secret number, and I'm sorry for those of you who waited for two and a half, three hours outside in line to get in, but we're friends and family private number that would still ring through even though they, they were already full for the night. And I would say, hi, it's, it's Michael uh, Bolton, and I need to try to get in with five or six people tonight. Is that possible? What time you come in, Mike? Then there would be the difficult experience of walking past people waiting in line. We now return to cutting in line in front of Italians. Hey! Oh. Now, when I was a citizen, I didn't mind so much, but when I became mayor, I felt it wasn't so egalitarian to cut lines, except for pizza. Our pizza, I'll cut the lines. You had to keep your head down while you were walking past people who were looking and not necessarily noticing, oh, is that the singer? You know, they're more thinking, where are they going? Why? Wait, how are they getting in? That phone number is not secret. It's hooked up to my home. So when I come to work, I hook it up here. So any, you know, I do have family in case they have to get to me in an emergency. But I could discontinue that because we all have cell phones now. To have that number was a very, very special thing. That would be like an all-access pass backstage. Everybody calls me Flo, so we're friends, call me Flo. Sal was Mr. Pepe's nephew. My mother-in-law and Mr. Pepe were brother and sister. My father, who worked for his uncle down the street, and my uncle Tony, also my father's younger brother, they both worked there. They learned the trade from Uncle Frank. My brother-in-law, who worked there with him, Uncle Tony, had words with the uncle, so he walked out, and naturally, his brother followed him. Right. Uh, somewhere along the way, uh, there was a baker who wasn't doing very well. This was a bread bakery. In the late 30s, it went under, and my grandmother bought it. She hocked some jewelry, and for $500, they bought the business from the baker and uh, started Sally's Pizza. Tony was still a minor, and uh, you had to be 21 or over to get a, a beer permit. And that's all they wanted was a beer and cider permit. So that's why I got to be called Sally's. My grandmother opened down the street from her brother. There was never any animosity. If anything, he helped. And Uncle Frank would, would help him help my father. There's always been the saying, you know, Sally's or Peppies. Makes it seem like we're competing. There's no competition. I'm very friendly with my husband's cousins, and they're friendly with me. Do you ever eat their pizza? No. When I graduated high school, it was 1940. At that time, uh, his brother Tony was there. His sister Connie and Sarah were the waitresses. So when we would go to Sally's, we would get there like, after getting to at the theater, as young kids in the, in the uh, we would get there like 11.15 or something, and, like how we have pizza and playing cards or what have you. It was like 1, 1, 1 30 in the morning, and we were still high school students. Do you, do you remember what a small pie would cost back then? Or? All I know is one <laughs> the only thing is, when I took my family to eat pizza, it was the cheapest place that I could go and support and, and feed my family. It was a good meal for a reasonable price, right. and so, we had a lot of factories in New Haven then, and a lot of the factory workers would come in. In those days, a Sal would open for lunch, and then close, and then open, and he'd stay open till one, two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, he had long, hard hours.
He's the boss. No, no, I'm not. No, boss, really, man. he takes care of everything in the kitchen and he leaves the floor to me. I love the interior of Sally's. Sally's looked like what I would want a pizza place to look like, like in the Sopranos or something. Like you walk in, it was old school, old feel. Everything about it felt right. Look at that pie. Makes me want to cry, Frank. It's a work of art. The crust, so brown. Let's see. What, we got an 8.8 eight and an 8.5 so far in New Haven. One bite, everybody knows the rules. In Wooster Street, right? That's where we're at? Yep. Yeah. Flo and the family do not consider their place a restaurant. It's an extension of their house. They feel like they're throwing a party or that they have invited you or in, into their house. It's not a retail establishment in the way that most retail establishments are. So, I think, again, some people are not comfortable with that, and they feel, this is ridiculous, you know? I just want pizza. You know, why can't I just go in and have a pizza in peace? Well, that's not part of what going over to the, you know, Consiglio's house is like. And you just have to sort of accept that. Some people bridle at that. They get caught up in the... Is it fair? Is it unfair? Is it this? Is it that? And the fact of the matter is, they're not asking you if you think it's fair. You know, you can go to Modern, you can go to Pepe's. So I think it's uh, suspending a little bit of what you think is control as a diner. Uh, that's really what the Sally's experience is about, is accepting that, you know, you're, you're in their, their dining room, and, you know, they're going to give you what they want to give you, and you're okay with that, you know, because you're at Sally's. Really good. 9-2. 9-2. I would say to anybody that's uh, that's asking, what is a plain pie? What's a New Haven plain pie? It's called a tomato pie. It's a red pie. It is grated cheese only. It's just Romano cheese. There is no moots. When grandpa and my grandmother did start, pizza was just plain tomato, grated cheese, oil, garlic, and, and oregano for garnish. We didn't know anything of any bacon. We didn't know anything of a sausage. We're just plain tomato sauce. Just the, the plain, plain sauce. Plain, the plain the marinara. Sauce. And I couldn't afford anything more. The standard of a, of a pizza, I think, is a, a plain. How good is your sauce? How good is your crust? Let's eliminate all the other stuff and let's see what you got. Pizza is, at its heart, such a simple food. I don't want its faults or its pleasures to be hidden. So, but a plain pie, you can't hide bad sauce or a crust, nondescript cheese. I mean, it is what it is. The first thing I look on the menu, is there, is the word plain up there? If there isn't plain, I'm in trouble. I don't, I don't even want to go there because they, they don't get it. 
or they don't get it, but let's put it this way, their clientele demands something else. But they do dream up some really weird concoctions, though. Oh, yeah, we've seen, like, uh, sausage, sausage, pepperoni, and anchovy, you know? Disgusting, but... And cucumbers. <laughs> Wait a second. What is it, that? It's cucumbers. No, no, you can't put a cucumber on a pizza. It's not mozzarella, it's moots. And I don't know, it, that's just a traditional way that uh, New Haven has described their mozzarella. And it, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an Italian American, so I, don't, I can't give it the kind of flourish that some of the proprietors can um, of, of each of these New Haven institutions. But yeah, it's, it's moots. In New York, in Boston, in some of these older places, Trenton, New Jersey, you, you get some of these restaurants that they, they understand, they, they still call it a marinara. They may not call it a plane. You know, and it, it is, it's a testament to the history and tradition. And a lot of them lost that. They lost it probably in the 50s, when the, sort of the popularity of just a cheese pizza became prevalent everywhere. There is a huge learning curve, uh, especially, I mean, the country's huge. I mean. E you travel, people travel, you get to the Midwest, they have no idea. Would you like some pizza? Well, I want this pizza. You don't know what pizza is? <laughs> Where are you from? I'm from Kansas. Sally's Peppies were modern. Modern. I uh, was dating my wife, who was living around the corner from Modern uh, about 15 years ago, and uh, uh, that, uh, that became our spot. So I love Peppies, I love Sally's, but uh, I'm a Modern guy. Modern is the definition of pizza. This is amazing. This is a Stone Cold Stunner to get the one, two, three off right here. Mmm. The story of Modern is a really uh, amazing story. You, you gotta go back to a guy named Antonio Tolli. And he was born in Plainville. He ended up going back to Italy with his family and grew up in Italy in the teens and 20s and finally came back to New Haven to live with his uncle in 1930 as an 18-year-old. His uncle was none other than Giuseppe Marzullo, one of the earliest Italian pastry maker in New Haven. His place was on Wallace Street. Tolli learned how to make pastries from his uncle. In 1933, after the repeal of Prohibition, a lot of these guys were considering opening up restaurants. They could sell booze, they could uh, have some pizza. Tony went to business with his cousin, and they opened up a place, uh, and they named it Washington Pizzeria on Washington mm -hmm. Avenue. In 36, um, the understanding is that the two split. Marzullo went back to making pastries on Washington Avenue, and Tolly opened up a completely new pizzeria on State Street. He opened up where Modern is today. He built an oven in the back. It was the same kind of oven that Peppy built, a middle B oven from Boston. And he named it uh, after himself, Tony's Abitz. He opened up a lot of restaurants. Tony was a busy guy. And all the while he was training people, you know, he was a cook, he was a really good cook. Um, and he trained people as well. One of the guys he trained was Louis Persano. Louis took over the business in the early 40s. And he also had another guy named Nick Nuzzo. They all worked for Tony. They really had to find a new name. And the story that we hear is that Nick Nuzzo went next door to the Polish drugstore owner, John Wozniak, and he said, we don't want to call it Tony's anymore. What should we call it? And he says, well, you guys are new, right? So let's call it Modern. And that's how that name stuck, Modern Abitz. And what year was that? That was in 42. The trade name for Modern Abitz is listed and recorded in 1944. And the sign that we uh, now understand, there was a neon sign that, that was first made, uh, most likely comes from that time period. So over time, um, you know, you got different owners. So Louis Persano became a fireman. Nick Nuzzo took over in the early 50s. And he owned it for 40 years with his son and wife and all his family. And finally, after the death of Nick's son, Barry, in 87, they sold it to Bill Pustari. So I had a pizza place prior to this in Fairfield on Black Rock Turnpike in Fairfield, Connecticut. And that was in 1986. Nick wanted to sell the place, but he didn't want to put it on the market. He didn't want people to know. It was going downhill so fast. I had a meeting with Nick at his house. I said, obviously you need help. I'll start working for you. That was Monday, we had the meeting. I started working Tuesday, the next day, here as a pizza man. 
And then it took us about six months to make the deal and close on it. And those years, that's where we became like the local place. Know where the locals go. When I'm at Modern, I don't feel the weight of the pressure that Peppies and Sally's I think have, that everybody in New Haven kind of has to pick a side. And from being from outside of New Haven, I like that Modern is a little bit more user-friendly for me as a New York, New Jersey guy. You know, it's more of what I'm used to. Size and shape wise, it's a, it's a cleaner cut for me. And it's got more cheese coverage, so it just feels more familiar. To me, modern then and modern now is just a continuation. It's family. I mean, after CYO, everybody would go for pizza. You went ice skating, everybody went for pizza. It was part of your life. It was part of your socializing. It was part of being young. Have you noticed any changes in the beats over the years? The Abits, the taste seems to be the same. They're probably fo following the same formula for putting it together. You know, we have to be consistent, so we have consistent product all the time, and we have consistent help. So the help never changes here. Everyone's been there. I mean, most of my guys have been there 28 years, 30 years. They don't leave. They've only made pizza here. They've never made pizza anywhere else, and they've all learned here. So in the rotation of making pizza here, you have to start at the bottom. And then as your job changes, you keep moving up until you become a pizza man. We don't hire a pizza man. You'll never see an ad in a newspaper saying, help wanted pizza man at Modern. We don't hire them like that. So we teach them all from the bottom up. So everyone works their way up to the top. And I think that's what, you know, that's why we have the same quality that we have because everyone learned here. No one's bringing in their own thoughts and their outside stuff, so. And you also still make the pies. I still do, you know, after 30 years. If I'm not on the schedule, but if we, we get busy, we get a big order, I jump right in and make them. And everyone knows that because I trained everybody. I didn't graduate business school. <laughs> I graduated from Restaurant U. I make pizzas, and that's, that's all I ever did, and that's all I wanted to do. So how much meat is on this? There are three meats on it. Pepperoni, sausage, and bacon. Then there's also three vegetables on it, peppers, onions, and mushrooms, and garlic, obviously. We call it a diet pizza. The three vegetables cancel out the three meats. What is it that you think makes the modern pie such a great pie? So it's an old-fashioned dough. The dough that we use, I don't use yeast. I use a natural airborne yeast. I use something called a mother. So the mother is a living, breathing thing and you have to keep feeding it. And by feeding it, what I mean is as you use it, you have to give it more flour because there's natural yeast that's already in the wheat, that's in the air. That's how Belgians make beer. Well, that's how we make dough. And that was the original way to make dough. We don't use a brewer's yeast or a dry powder yeast. We actually have a living mother. That's the way they make it in Europe and Italy. And you just keep reusing the old dough and that creates your yeast. Then we take that and we go to a 24-hour cold fermentation. So we let the dough rise in a cooler instead of letting the dough rise outside. How much dough do you have in the cooler at one time? We make dough twice a day. So after lunch, if we went through 10 trays of dough, 10 trays would be 150 pizzas. You go downstairs and they refill those 10 trays and put them back in a walk-in box again. But right now we have about 60 to 70 trays, average 10, so 700 pizzas of dough in a rotation that's constantly rotating. Only San Marzano tomatoes, only olive oil, and we use the best cheese that we could buy. And, you know, it's not the fresh mozzarella cheese, you know, your typical Naples pizza. It's American mozzarella, but it's a whole milk. There's a high content of butter fat in it because we have high temperature ovens with a lot of top heat. So we don't have as much bottom heat, but we have a lot of top heat. So you need the butter fat in the cheese so it doesn't burn. I could buy cheese at $2 a pound. I could buy cheese at $3 a pound. So if I choose to buy it at $2 a pound and I'm, and I'm buying 50,000 pounds a month, well, I'm saving $50,000, right? Corporate's not gonna let that go. I let it go because it's not what I want to put out. It's not my product. Owning this place, it's kind of like being a lead singer in a rock and roll band. You can't do it by yourself. So it's everybody. It's all the employees. It's everyone that works here. It's a mentality. 
that is brought in that everyone shares. I got the best drummer, I got the best bass player, I got the best producer, I got the best tour manager, I got the best everything. And it's putting it all together. And I, I could guarantee you, I don't, there's no restaurant that has a better staff than here. On his grading scale from one to five, it's definitely a number five. Mm -hmm. Might be a five point five. Mm -hmm. So it's off the scale for me. There were no temperature gauges in those days, but they could tell by the, the bricks on the outside of the oven, the opening. Mm -hmm. And it, when, when the keystone, the one, very up, the one right over the top turned a little bit gray, that meant that they, it was at the right heat and it was ready to, you know, it was ready to go. We cook it between uh, 600 and 650 degrees. We cook, oh, around 700, I right? did, it, it, you know, fire oven. So it's fluctuating everywhere in the oven is different. We let it die out at night. You know, it's still glowing when I lock up. And I come in the next day, rake it out. It's probably around anywhere from maybe 270 to around three, a little over 300. I rake it out, start a new fire, and it takes a good couple hours to bring it up to heat again. Well, when we close for vacation, it takes three days because you have to build it up gradually or you crack the bricks. Now, on a Tuesday, it takes longer than it would on a Wednesday because it retains some of the heat. But being closed on a Monday, you have to start from scratch, so you have to get in here earlier to start it. I would say maybe about five, six hours to get it up to baking temp. The ovens were originally coke. Coke, which is a coal derivative. It's a softer type of coal. The oven had collapsed, I believe it was in the 70s, the inside, they rebuilt it and tried this with an oil burner, fired into a pit, so it's an open flame coming up just like if it was wood or anything else. So it's not really the, the fuel source, it's the style of the oven. So it's a beehive oven compared to a French bread oven, so the two differences in the oven. So a beehive oven would be an old bread oven that's tall, a French bread oven they're a dome this way. They're shorter, they're lower inside, so they heat differently. The beehive causes a convection. So as the burner goes off, the fire comes up and rolls over the top of it. And it's almost like cooking in the convection oven. It's the original convection oven, put it that way. Different ovens cook different ways. That's the unique character of each of those places are those ovens. Something that's been around for that many years, it's infused with the oil, with the, with the sauce, with everything. That oven has got a, a, a character that you can't, you can't duplicate it. I don't care. Yeah, you'd have to wait another 60 years. Maybe it will taste the same. But otherwise, no. Nah, it doesn't work. It doesn't work the same. If it's all about the oven, then you're taking all the, all the credit away from the real hero, the pizza maker. You put a good pizza maker on a bad oven, and they're gonna make you something better than a bad pizza maker on a good oven. Guaranteed. When I was a kid, I needed dough, so I worked at night. I worked for Mr. Pizza, making deliveries on my bike. I fed my buns all over town for all the tips I got. When I got there, I made sure my pizza was still hot. I think the pizza, 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 pizza boy is here. I got you that hot pizza. I hope you got the beer. The erosion of historical New Haven became conspicuous and obvious in the 1920s. And if you look at the redlining maps that were prepared 
by the Roosevelt administration in the 1930s. The presence of Italians, most notably Southern Italians, was a sure ticket to a low rating. The neighborhoods we're talking about with the pizzerias and the immigrant workforce were levels C and D. The bigotry embodied in the Homeowners Loan Association, which was created by the New Deal, was a way of stopping mortgage foreclosures. And so what they did was they looked at what correlated with high foreclosure rates. And the answer was cheap housing near factories full of immigrant families. So they redlined all that. And the sense of an urban crisis was there for the first time in, in the 30s. Lee was an M80 in a mailbox. Lee discovered urban renewal in the Housing Act of 1949 and discovered that you could transform the appearance, if not the reality, of a neighborhood in short order with eminent domain and the forcible use of bulldozers and did indeed destroy the Oak Street neighborhood where the Route 34 connector now runs. It was a real melting pot kind of a, kind of a neighborhood. Lee hit it pretty hard, basically took it out of, out of existence. And there was a fundamental fallacy in urban renewal. That neighborhood was ugly to look at. The plumbing was inadequate. The ventilation, light and air, and all those things were inadequate. But the crime rate was really low. And the rate at which kids got educated was pretty high. And if you looked at, if you compared any of these immigrant neighborhoods, pre-urban renewal with post-urban renewal, the ones that came out best were the ones which resisted it altogether. And the ones which came out worst were the ones where the bulldozers did the big scraping. In the name of progress, they destroyed these old ethnic neighborhoods and told people that they had to leave. They were told that the city was going to be renovated, that they could come back, but that never happened. I grew up on a place called Hill Street, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we all got booted out for urban renewal. Then you got all of the social stuff that starts happening because neighborhoods have been ripped up and people are trying to find their roots again. You're trying to find something to hold on to. Thank goodness for a lot of these restaurants that people were so loyal to because that was that's what we held on to. The, the directors of urban renewal said, well, look, why don't we get rid of this blighted area? Because to them, it was a blighted area. To people who lived there, it was home, a neighborhood, with people who spoke the same language. Frank Pepe was considered a leading businessman, and his business was going to be one of the sort of feature businesses that would actually help the others to stay. Sally's was also considered sort of a featured business that Hey, it's bringing people down, let's keep it there. And I think the Italians, since they still lived in that area, they did not want to leave. Areas like Hamilton Street, Franklin Street, East Street, Grand Ave, they had lots of Italians living there. They had Polish communities there, German, Irish communities, African-American and Jewish communities, all of which were forced to uproot, but they weren't as connected together as the Worcester Square community. And part of that reason is because of the strength of those businesses and businessmen like Frank Pepe, but also because of the churches, the societies that were all located right there. It's kind of like looking at a web. If a web is too strong, you can't break it. Getting into the 60s, just after the highways were finished, you've got a city that's literally been flipped upside down and its roots ripped out. It's, uh, it's bleeding. There's a lot of racial tension, there's civil unrest. Um, the whole country was going through this. You had the Vietnam War. People feel like they don't trust the government and they're angry. Everybody was starting to look at each other in a different way. And you had the riots of 67. National Guard was brought into New Haven. They had curfew for about a month. People could not go out after sundown. There was tremendous white flight in the 70s. Everyone, everyone moved out. I felt that the Avid's places um, have had their own definition in the city through good times and through bad, mm -hmm. because you always knew who was there, what you were gonna get, and that it was gonna be special. Mm -hmm. So through good times and bad times, you know, through tough economic times, uh, through good economic times, they've shown up.
to have those three places in that close pr proximity is amazing. So yeah, I would say for this, the size that New Haven is, I would say it is the pizza capital of the United States. If you want to settle a dispute, your money's going to be on the New Haven pie. You're going to want the New Haven pie to go out back and settle your dispute for you because it's going to win whatever fight. You know, it's the Chicago, eh, it's a little doughy, it's a little thick, it's a little sluggish. Um, New York, I think over the years, has just sort of lost its oomph. Um, but New Haven is still can still pack a punch and is still sort of, um, we'll, we'll win the fight. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Chicago pizza is not pizza. I mean, it's a casserole. It's just, you know, a bunch of stuff, you know, put in a pan. This is not pizza. This is tomato soup in a bread bowl. What we do is pizza. What we do is, you know, is horizontal. This <laughs> is an above ground marinara swimming pool for rats. We have figured out a, a unique way to do pizza, largely, you know, based on our, you know, Italian heritage in Connecticut and New Jersey and in New York. Uh, we did have a contest. Uh, it was uh, uh, Sally's Pizza uh, versus a Chicago pizza. And uh, the two people who were involved in the Chicago side of it were my then colleague, Rahm Emanuel, who is now the mayor of Chicago, uh, and um, uh, uh, Bob Giuliano, who works with uh, Unite Here, who was also from Chicago. So they brought in pizza from Chicago. I brought in the pizza from Sally's. So I sent out this tweet, which turned out to be pretty inflammatory, claiming that uh, the only place that good pizza existed was in, you know, the the New York metropolitan area, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And as it turns out, lots of people around the country are pretty parochial about their pizza. And I found out about all sorts of unique styles of pizza that I didn't know existed, uh, people responding to that tweet. Detroit Square, Detroit style uh, yeah. pizza. Yeah, who knew? It's not a thing. Detroit style pizza is not a thing. And I, I had to break that to my colleagues from the Michigan delegation. And uh, we had this fundraiser and people had to vote. Um, overwhelming Sally's and the Chicago pizza got two votes, Emmanuel and Giuliano. <laughs> that was it. And being from Chicago, how do you yeah, feel well, about Chicago so versus crazy. New Haven pizza? Oh. Don't strike me dead, but Chicago pizza isn't even pizza. This is, this is the stuff. Betsy Carp is taking her pizza half cooked and will warm it up when she arrives home. New York City. Where? New York City. Why are you taking the pizza back to New York City, which probably has some of the best pizza in the country? Because it's the best pizza in the world. I don't want to insult you. I don't want to tell you it's not as good. So I say to them right away, you got to try the pizza here. I go, you know what? I love my pizza. It's like my wife. You got it. Here's a pretty woman. No, I love my wife. I go home, I love my wife. It's the same thing with pizza. Here's a great pizza. No, I'll go home and I love my pizza at home. So I have my pizza at home. New Haven is not known as well as New York, but we have 23 to 30 cities around the country that have New Haven style pizza. Probably the best known pizza joint in DC is Pete's New Haven style pizza. And the reason is, is because people from the New Haven area move to somewhere else and they find that they can't have, there's nothing good out there that comes close to what they grew up with. Even though their pizza is not the exact same as Modern or Sally's or Pepe's, um, it's a pretty reasonable facsimile. They either have a family background or they get a recipe and they, they start making pie. Um, it often comes with Fox and Park soda. Grandfather actually came here, I'm gonna say around 1910, 1911, opened up Hamilton Bottling Works, another soda company. He went back to Italy because his family was there. A few years later, he came back here to the States and uh, there just wasn't enough room for him. With that, he looked for property, looked to do something, came across the spring here in Foxen and then he made the deal, bought the property. New Haven was always noted for a good pizza. So as people grew up in the area, in New Haven, had pizza there and had Fox and Park because of the relation my grandfather had with the original owners of these pizza restaurants, people that worked for these pizza restaurants went off on their own and it just seemed to be a fit to right. take Fox and Park with them. So they'll bring out Fox and Park, they'll put up New Haven memorabilia like all around the, the restaurant. You know, you got San Francisco, Portland, Oregon, Hood River, Oregon, San Diego, did I mention that? All these cities on the West Coast, they all have uh, New Haven style pizzerias. There's one in the Keys, there's two in Southern Florida, Chicago. I grew up in New Haven in the Westville section. I recognized right away that, that you know, this is a place in which 
if it can be executed as it is in New Haven, as well or similarly, um, it will be well, well received. People aren't stupid. You give them a great product, they're going to embrace it. So that's where, you know, that's where it started, you know? And we always wanted to have, have a pizza like Sally's in Chicago, and we, we couldn't. Chicago's known for deep dish pizza, not known for, for thin crust. I was introduced to Rick Nielsen of Cheap Trick, and Rick um, invested in peace. I bought what I liked, and that way it's like buying art or whatever. So like if, you, if you're thinking, oh man, I'm gonna make a big investment, it's gonna do great. And if you don't, then if it doesn't do great, then it's like, oh God, look at this ugly thing. So you gotta get stuff that you like, and so like with peace, it was an investment opportunity that I had uh, to be involved. You know, I thought that pizza may, might be something that united us. Apparently, pizza divides us uh, in this country, uh, just like many of the other hot political topics do these days. So uh, we'll have to find something else uh, that brings us all together. The passion for pizza in, in New Haven is, is unrivaled anywhere else in this country. And that makes me very, very proud. It's also, you know, whenever I'm not in New Haven and I tell someone, oh, I represent Ward 8 in New Haven, they say, I don't know what that means, what's Ward 8? I say, well, you know where Pepe's and Sally's are, and immediately, even if they haven't been to New Haven in decades or have never been, they will know exactly where that is because it is really one of the, heart, one of the hearts of New Haven, one of the hearts of the whole state. Oh God, what's that smell? It sure as hell isn't pizza. Clams. New Haven style pizza. I had it when I was at Yale. Yale's on its way out. That's why I started my own line of colleges. 287 campuses. We took over all the old circuit cities. <laughs> no one's coming to save you. <sighs> because we're deep inside one of Connecticut's 30 beautiful state forests. 30! Oh, please, don't kill me. I still haven't tried the famous seafood pizza at Sally's in New Haven. New Haven. Right before a certain shady restaurant owner moved from there to New York City, bringing his disgusting New Haven pizza with him. I think New Haven pizza as a community has the best pizza in America. And the difference between pizza, good pizza, and great pizza, the kind of pizza that, that's, that's special, it, it, it isn't a recipe that's a combination of ingredients. It's alchemy. It's the way those ingredients react to one another. It's, it's, the, it's the way the crust accepts the sauce, that accepts the cheese, that accepts the clam. The first record of clams on a pizza is actually at Sally's. On their menu, from the early 50s, there was a clam and tomato pizza offered. It wasn't a white clam pie, it was, it was with tomato sauce. Fast forward about 10 years, maybe into the 60s, Frank Pepe was experimenting, and he found that if, if you put clams on a pie that had no red sauce, you put olive oil, garlic, and Romano cheese, that it was like, the perfect combination. It tasted like a little bit of ocean, a little bit of pizza, and a little bit of, you know, kind of Italian food that you might have, like a, like a pasta vongole, pasta with clams. That hit a lot of people's taste buds. That was the one that stayed. It was not on their menu until probably the 70s, but it was served in the 60s. Pepe died in 69, so that was his recipe, and that's what they're known for. It, it carried on from his tradition. It's kind of his you could almost call it his last gift to America. Is there any secret ingredient? I mean, what is it that makes New Haven pizza, in many people's opinion, the best pizza in the world? I can only speak for here, it's TLC. I mean, every pie that comes out here, out, we take pride in it. Um, it's, not, it's not to produce a product, it's to make a great product. The, the secret is the, is the feel, the sensitivity of the person handling the pizza, of the person putting it together. That's, that's what makes one 
different from another. It's the, it's the human element. My passion about the product is always about balancing the ingredients. And I find that to be a, a, a big challenge in a very simple way. You could just be dealing with four or five ingredients, simple, you know, water, yeast, dough, flour rather, and tomatoes, grated cheese, and oil. And that could be very, very challenging to achieve a very beautiful experience, tasting experience. Yeah, to get it right. What's in the water here? A lot of pollution. If you don't have a good base, a good crust, it all doesn't work. And I think it's because of the water and the flour that we get. It makes pizza here different from someplace else. Could the water be, it could be. You know, maybe that's why Lender's Bagels does so good. I, it could be. Yeah, that's a crock of shit. I don't think you will ever know why. I don't think scientifically you could probably find out why it is. I don't know. Well, no, no, I'm gonna tell you the truth. Not a crock of shit. Kenji Lopez Altar, managing editor who is a scientific bent, writes our Food Lab column. And he once conducted an experiment with the owner of Motorino, which is a really good wood-fired pizzeria in New York, where he made crusts with many different kinds of water. It's like the bagel water thing, too. Everyone talks about, oh, you can't make good bagels in Kansas City because of the water. I just don't think it's true. I'm not scientifically oriented, so I am not offering a definitive opinion. It is without a doubt not the water. It really could be the water. You can't have a great bread product without great ingredients that includes great water. You know, it's the atmosphere that's more than the water. So when you try and make dough, say in Denver, and you know, at a mile up, compared to making dough in Louisiana where you're below, the, you're below zero, and that is the difference of the dough being able to fermentate and rise more than the water. When it's hotter, we have to make adjustments. When it's colder, we have to make adjustments. If it's humid, if we know it's gonna be humid, we have to make adjustments. Here's the funny thing about water. And this was told to me in New York City. This was told to me by Pizziolo in New Haven. Uh, you can have really good pizza in New Haven. You can have pretty good pizza in New York, but you can also have pretty shitty pizza and that's using the same water. Being the adornment and upscale hotel in New Haven, uh, people come in from all over the world. They say, Eugene, they said inside that you know everything about New Haven. So tell us, where can we go have a pizza with the children? I says, Worcester Street. The excitement of getting in and having that that pizza is in great demand. Sometimes people will just wait in line for an hour or so because they have to have it. The guests, when they do go and they wait in line, you know what they do? They bring the box back to take home. I had a lady say, so I'm gonna take this home and I'm gonna put it in a frame. What could be better than that? The line started in the 70s, especially at Sally's and Pepe's, and then Modern actually had a little bit of a later bloom. I remember back in the early to mid 80s, the line would be like, like 100 people out there. And Sunday we would open up at 2.30. When we open up the door, we seat 150 people. The whole place would fill up and there'd be a line outside. So there was, there was like 150 plus people waiting at 2.30 on a Sunday to come in for pizza. All of a sudden, pizza became a big thing. And that's when it started getting, before we kept our heads above water, well above water. Mm -hmm. And then it just escalated. The late 80s was really, we were busy. We were very, very busy. And the amount of pizzas we pumped out was, you know, astronomical. Then, now, it, it's mind boggling. We're pumping out, let's say on a typical week uh, during the summertime, we're pumping out six, seven, 800 pies a day. We have three ovens, so we're able to handle the capacity. The line, however, still does form, but it does move quickly. I think it's part of the experience. Well, I would also set the scene that you would have people standing in line 
and it's snowing. I never remembered waiting in line when I was a kid. I waited all the lines, cold, rain, what? snow. If you want a taste of Sally's Pizza, prepare to wait hours. This line formed on a rainy Sunday an hour before the place opened. It's worth it. Sometimes you wait an hour, hour and a half, and then you sit down, it's another 45 minutes. Between outside and inside, okay. two hours. What do you think's the longest anyone's ever waited to get in? Hours, a couple hours. Do you wonder why? Man, my father used to wonder, what's the big deal? It's just bread, the little stuff on it. I've come here once and it was like 20 below. Waited over an hour. I didn't care. So the rain is nothing. This is nothing. I often thought, and it's very odd, but there's several times in my life that I thought, and this goes back to the Cold War, that this would be a great film for the Russians to see how people have to stand in line for food in America. In, in general, I try to not eat pizza after after show because it's a it's you know it's easy to eat pizza after show or too easy. But but so so it, it but it, so so New Haven is one of those places where I make an exception to that effort and and I just completely give in to it. So so I I it would be unfair of me to say that I you know that I'm a pizza expert and I try pizza all over because because I I try to resist it. But I just know better in New Haven. I know better than to fight it. Well, we've had many, many celebrities here over the years. I'm Henry Winkler. I'm here to talk about Pepe's Pizza in New Haven. Only the best pizza in all of America. I've had pizza everywhere. Pretty good in LA, very good in New York, great at Pepe's Pizza. Bill Clinton and Hillary. She had uh, a fundraiser in our parking lot and they raised a quarter of a million dollars. This was when he was first running for president. But where did the candidate go? He was over at Pepe's, spreading on the sauce, tossing on the mozzarella, and slicing up his very own pie. It was a campaign stop that brought shock and awe to Pepe's Pizza in New Haven. Unannounced, Bill Clinton walked through the doors and started shaking hands and reliving old memories of him and Hillary on their first date in New Haven while they were at Yale. They were constantly here when they were at Yale. Didn't look anything like themselves today. President Reagan came here. Robin Williams. Sammy Davis Jr. Neil Simon. Danny DeVito. Johnny Mathis. Bill Murray. Gary Trudeau. Sinatra, well, everybody knows about him. Tony was in high school, and Tony was uh, kind of a rascal. He would go play hooky from school, and one day found himself uh, going down to Hoboken, New Jersey to, you know, have a good time, maybe fun go to visit family or do whatever. And while on playing on the street, he met up with a guy named uh, Frank Sinatra, who was a budding musician. When Frank had his first show in New Haven, it was uh, a show at the Goff Street Armory. There were so many places around New Haven that had big bands come in and out. It was in 1941 in March, and they literally flew in that evening from Providence, Rhode Island into New Haven. It was the Tommy Dorsey band, uh, the Pied Pipers, including Frank Sinatra, and they were hungry. It was like 12.30, 1.30 in the morning. They asked Tony, hey, is your brother's restaurant open? So he calls his brother and says, keep the, keep the ovens going. I want to bring uh, uh, the band over. They showed up a little bit later and ate all night. I guess the story is, is that when Frank went up to pay, Philomena Consiglio, Tony and Sally's mom, she said, well, we got this. And the quote is, we love you guys. You know, we don't want you to pay. So Frank never forgot that. You know, that was the kind of passion and connection that that family showed to anyone who was their friend, anyone who was their family. He really was a Sally's fan, diehard. And anybody that Frank knew or Tony knew, they'd bring him over to Sally's and tell him, you gotta try Sally's. I worked at the Paramount Theater, and while at the Paramount Theater, Frank decided he wanted a pizza. So you get one of the drivers and send me all the way from New York 
up here to Sally to get Pete's and bring him backstage at the Paramount Theater. Early on, Tony would do the driving. He'd come down. He said it was an hour and a half ride. Don't forget, this is before I-95. And then, of course, the pizza would be cold. But on the third floor, uh, the Paramount Theater had a, a tailor. He was there in case somebody popped a button, something got ripped, something had to be changed. And he had sort of a little oven. So Tony would go up there, reheat the pizza, uh, bring it down, and they'd have hot pizza. There was one time when someone called me at home and said, do you know Spielberg's standing outside waiting in line at your restaurant? And I was like, Steven Spielberg? He's like, yeah, I, I got to go there. And I've never left my house for anybody. And I walked over to him, just wanted to say hi. And he was so genuine and just so nice. Other customers are going by saying hi to him. He would sign stuff for him. He was just a normal, everyday person. And I give people like that so much credit because he didn't use card blanche to try to get in, try to cut the line. Can I get this first? Can I have that? He didn't, my people are going to call you. There wasn't any of that. Is it true that Spielberg sent a private jet to Tweed to pick up pizzas? He was here, he flew in, and had a whole bunch of pizzas delivered to him. We delivered them down to the jet to bring them back to California to show everybody what real pizza was, because he said, there's no pizza in California like this. That is insane. <laughs> no, no plates, all on trays. Ooh, look at that. 80 year old oven. Look at that, amazing. Stop hiding, Captain. And there's the team there. Thank you. Screw Pepe's. Well, the New Haven Coliseum opened, and I met Ricky Consiglio in 1977. And I started to order pizzas backstage for all our concerts. And we'd order 10 to 20 pizzas at one time. I started to get artists to play New Haven because they wanted the pizza. Just in the last few months, we've had Whitney Houston eat Sally's Pizza, U2 ate Sally's Pizza, The Grateful Dead have eaten Sally's Pizza, Pat Benatar. Emerson Lake and Palmer loved it, Beach Boys loved it, James Taylor loves it, Linda Ronstadt. Dave Matthews in 2008 sells posters at every one of his concerts that relate directly to the show. He had a guy holding pizza in on each poster. I could go on and on because we had it for every single show. This is, you know, way, way, way pre-9-11. We were performing at the Royal Albert Hall in London. My musical director, Joey Malati, drummed up the greatest surprise for us. He somehow got his wife, Pam, to bring about six pizzas onto the plane. She brought a half a dozen Sally's pizzas from JFK to London and came backstage and they were waiting for us. And it was an impossible, it was like, what? It's my favorite venue in the world. And, and I was having my favorite pizza in the world. And the pizza took over everybody's attention, basically. <laughs> took precedence. As we sit here editing the film, we realize there's one story we don't have on tape. And I don't even have any verification for it. It might be a myth, it might be an urban legend, but if it is, it's the Bigfoot of tall pizza tales. It goes like this. President Bill Clinton and Vice President Al Gore were visiting Yale. Their press secretary calls Sally's, Flo answers the phone. The press secretary says, the president and vice president would like to come to lunch at your establishment. Flo says, but we're not open for lunch. The press secretary says, you don't understand. This is the president and vice president of the United States. To which Flo replies, we don't open early for anybody. The second uh, story, a gentleman, Joe Consiglione calls me up, local handman guy, he's the announcer for the Red Sox. Calls me up, he goes, Billy, I'm gonna bring some of the guys in from the Red Sox. Kevin Euclid, Larry Lucchino, the CEO of the Red Sox, uh, another Yale, another Yale guy. And uh, I said, great. I said, I'll see you at lunch. So th they came in and, you know, I was shaking all the hands. Nice to meet you, Joe. Nice seeing you. So Larry Lucchino comes up to me and he goes, Bill, nice to meet you, but I really got to tell you, I'm a really big Sally's fan. I said, that's okay, because I'm a Yankee fan. I really don't care. So he kind of, we got a little giggle off of that. And he sits down and eats. And then after they're done eating, I'm leaving. I'm going to go eat lunch next door at the bar. 
So I go over to him, thanks for coming, nice meeting you, Joe, nice seeing you. And he's like, no, wait, you gotta sit down. I gotta talk about this. He goes, I think I'm a big modern fan now. I said, oh yeah, I think I'm a Red Sox fan now. And that was in 2004, and that's when they broke the curse. And that's when they won the World Series that year. And they invited me up for the parade to bring them pizzas to all the owners for after the parade for a private party. So basically what you're saying is, that by him switching his allegiance from Sally's to Modern is what broke the curse of Bambino and made them... I did. You, I take you, full credit for it. You, you, I told Theo Epstein that. <laughs> you're responsible for them winning the World Series yes. in 2004. Yep. I love that. Yes. The Boston Red Sox are world champions. That is the power of this holy trinity. A power fueled by love, family, charred crust, a cheese called moots, and ovens that are going on 100 years old. That is the power of a beats. But I believe that pizza is a connective tissue. It's something that makes us happy. It feeds us. It connects different people together. It's the one of the only shared foods by its very nature. I feel extremely fortunate to have the best pizza in the world right here at our fingertips. You know, I'm just an evangelist uh, for New Haven style pizza. Uh, and I see it as part of my job as Connecticut's United States Senator to make sure that everybody that I serve with in the United States Senate knows that if it's not New Haven style pizza, it's really not pizza. These places have relationships with their, uh, with their customers and, and I think it sort of cuts both ways. I mean, it, it gives a feeling of connectedness and purpose to the folks who operate these wonderful places, what would they do at Modern to support community events? I mean, they open that place up, they provide food, and it defines, in their case, a part of State Street. They make that block unlike any other block in America. As you look back on 30 years of doing this, any regrets? No regrets, but it just flies by. It's, I can't even believe it when you say those numbers. Like, I don't even feel like I'm 30 years older. I mean, it's just, I see pictures. I see pictures of myself and I go, holy crap, I was a young little kid. You know, I was 23 years old when I got here. What, what's your proudest moments in this place? Probably my kids. And my wife works every day. It really is probably one of the last full-blown family places. I, I mean, my enduring memory is you walk into Sally's, the first thing you do is you don't sit down. You go in, you kiss Flo. You go in the back, you'd say hello to Sally. Now you go to say hello to Ruthie, Ricky, or Bobby, whatever the case may be. Uh, you talk to them, you bump elbows with uh, whoever's making the pies. I don't know, we, we still do it the old way. Uh, people wait a long time. We're the culture of expediency, I think. I think it's the vibe. I think all of us, it's like a cult. I think a Sally's love is a really cultist. And I think that uh, with all due respect to Pepe's and Modern, they have their own cult also that think they're the best. And I, I think that Flo, Ricky, and Bobby really made it, uh, uh, they were the leaders of the cult and they were they're very strange people. The, the feeling that we all had is that we were members of his religion, the Sally's religion. And I think what made it special, of course, was the quality of the pie. We still like them one, one at a time. Table would sit down. We order three, four, five pies. They're still made one at a time, the old way. The oven's 100 years old. I feel like I'm 150. Pepe's, very traditional, that big, gleaming, white tile, coal fire oven. I, I can remember going in there, uh, and Frank Pepe's wife, Mrs. Pepe, she'd be by the cash register, and they bring the pies out, and she cut all the pies. I can, I can remember Mrs. Pepe as a kid doing that in her station, keeping an eye on everything that went around. You know, walking through the doors of Pepe's, um, you feel the history. You feel those decades from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s of Italian Americans settling in Worcester Square, and the pizza, those charred, oblong pies, the clam pie, you know, everything about it is so idiosyncratic, is so Pepe's. Whenever my agent calls and we're going over tour dates for an upcoming tour, and he says, and New Haven, the very first thing I think about is, 
Oh, good. Peppy's Pizza. If you've been away from the city for 20 years and you come back, you're going to go to one of these places because it's reconnecting you with your childhood, with great memories, with your parents who maybe have since passed. I mean, we do that. Fish swim upstream. You know, New Haven goes back to the Abitz joints. <laughs>